Get your air balls ready. Welcome to the Greg and Tim Show podcast. Take time to sit back and relax and enjoy the show. Here are your hosts, Greg and Tim. Well, welcome back to the Greg and Tim Show. I, as always, am Tim, and this is my buddy, Greg. Timmy. And we... And Greggy. We just, uh, interviewed uh, Dr. Dan Chenier. Yeah. Uh, he's a local uh, chiropractor, uh, but you know what? He's more than that. Yeah. And we had a great conversation with him, uh, ranging anywhere uh, from cracking backs uh, to, uh, we talked a little bit about then some healthy school trades, therapy, school therapy yeah. and it was a wide range of things. And uh, he had a lot of insight, and I really enjoyed uh, having the conversation. Like yeah. uh, everybody else that we talked to, he really brought some ideas I had never thought of. Uh, a couple at the end of the second part where I was a bit scared yeah. of. And that For those was, that don't know, that this, was more you're doing. This but is gonna, also, yeah, I'm not going to say anything about it. <laughs> For those that don't know, this is also a two part uh, interview yeah. series um, where. Dr. Dan uh, speaks to us in this first part. We're going to talk to him about how he got started in chiropractorship, chiropractic. We had problems with chiropractic. I said chiropractic. Chiropractic care. Yeah, we had. So, change. how he got started in chiropractic care, why he got started, and the different techniques that he uses yeah. for uh, for his chiropractic uh, business practice. Practice, yeah. practice, practice go. makes perfect. Anyway, um, let's get right into that interview, and uh, let's uh, let's go over to the go over to the other Greg and Tim. Let's roll. Let's roll. Grab your phone. It's podcast time. It's the Greg and Tim show. It's the Greg and Tim show. Well, welcome to the Greg. And Tim Show, it's so great to have a guest with us in the studio today. Today we have a very special guest on our show. He's Dr. Daniel Chenier. He's a chiropractor and wellness expert from Winnipeg, Manitoba. He's been freeing people's spines and making them feel better for more than two decades. He doesn't crack your back, though, and we will learn more about that later yeah, on. Definitely. Uh, he also uses cool tools uh, like I, I can I can attest to this. They're very cool tools. So like heart rate scans you were talking about, nutrition tips, and more. That's yep. kind of where things are at right now with, with people's health. But we'll get into that. We got to get into the bit, nutrition. Yeah. Yep. Uh, he loves to teach his clients and the public how to how chiropractic can help you at any age or stage in your life. Chiropractic. Chi chiropractic. Is, is that a tough chiropractic? Word? Chiropractic. Chi chiro chiropractic chiro care. Can I say chiro chiropractic care? How the chiro chiropractic care. So, the care. Anyway, we're going to chat with Dr. Dan <laughs> about some awesome health techniques and alternative we, medicines. So we want to have this chat just as like us having a chat. Yes. Just enjoying the time and uh, learning about some health stuff and trying to teach Tim some new words. And we're going to challenge Tim. So just to give you a heads up right now before we go into the interview with Dr. Dan. I've got a challenge for Dr. Dan and a challenge for Tim. And, and I don't know and anything. If about they it. accept the challenge, yeah. it'll be at the end of the video. Yeah. And if they don't accept the challenge, I'm still going to do it at the end of the video. So stay tuned because it's going to be awesome. Yeah, I think I'm going to crack his back or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> I think you're doing the car. Let's let's welcome Dr. Dan onto the. <laughs> welcome, the welcome, Dr. Dan. Welcome to the, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Thanks, Greg. I'm good. Good. How are you? Fantastic. We're uh, happy to be here. I'm glad you're wait, here. Wait, wait, welcome, just Greg. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Tim. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Me, me and Dr. Dan go back a little bit. So Lorraine actually used to, my wife used to work with Dr. Dan way back in the day, work mm -hmm. for him and do, I guess, what was it that she did with you? She did. She pretty much ran the place. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> she did a lot. And, and I'm not saying that, uh, I'm not just being because sarcastic. She's just on the easier. camera? <laughs> she did a lot. Yeah. I mean, she did everything from the front desk to helping out with examinations and yeah. just pretty much making sure everything ran from A to Z yeah. uh, other than adjusting. <laughs> and you were actually at a, at a previous chiropractor clinic when she started working for you originally, yes. right? Yes. And then you've moved into your own personal mm -hmm. chiropractic clinic. How long have you been there now for? So I practiced with my brother and my brother and my sister and my brother-in-law are all chiropractors. Yep. Um, so I practiced with all of them for about 12 years and I've been on my own for about 12 years as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So, yeah. so 24 years now then. Yeah. That's yeah. That's since 1999, the turn of the century. So, so question, and I don't know if you have this on your list of questions, but you Probably. said you have the whole family basically. Yes. 
is our chiropractic. Correct. That's, that's, I, that's kind of different. You don't see that often where a group of people so closely associated do the exact same thing. Right, so, right. So why? So you don't see it often in many professions, but you, you do see it often in chiropractic. My theory as to why that is, is um, it's more of a lifestyle. It's not a job. For me, it's not a job. For my family members, it's not a job. It's a lifestyle. Yeah. And um, so it, it's a, it, for us, the reason we all got into it, people often ask me that also, like, was your dad a chiropractor? Was your mom a chiropractor? No, they weren't. But uh, my mom was always a health nut. Okay. So she got us interested and passionate about health and wellness in general from day one. Yeah. As we were growing up, she and, and and we sought chiropractic care as we were children. She brought us to a chiropractor regularly as we were as, while we were growing up as kids, and um and then so we decided chiropractic was the vehicle, the best vehicle that we can use to deliver uh, wellness to the world. So back into the community, back into the community. Yeah, I I didn't grow up going to a chiropractor as a kid, so I'm not um, somebody who ever sought out that kind of stuff. Um, when I started working from home, oh man, I think it was like seven years ago now, I was working at the dinner table and Lorraine always went to see you all the time. Right. And I was working at the dinner table and because when I was working at the dinner table, I was sitting at uncomfortable chairs in an uncomfortable position. I didn't have like a good chair to sit in yet. And what happened was obviously my back started to feel bad and like I was getting up in the morning like like I couldn't bend up very easily. And when I did, it was hurting and mm -hmm. that type of thing. And mm -hmm. then I came in to see you right. and we did the whole, um, scan and me, yeah. yeah, we did all the scanning and everything like that. And, uh, I gotta tell you, I was a skeptic. Mm -hmm. So, cause you, I'm going to get into this in just a second. Sure. Your style is different sure. than yeah. everybody else's. Yeah. Right. So I was a skeptic, but when I got into it and started going regularly, I think I mm -hmm. went, three times a week or two, two or three times a week to start for the first couple of weeks. And then I, then it was down to like once every two weeks. And right. then, and then we got it back down because my back was, was better. And I was like blown away. And I was not, not to say that, that, um, I don't believe in chiropractic, but the style was so much different. Right. And I was, I was worried because I always heard cracked bones mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, how did you discover this network? It's called network spinal analysis. Yeah, network spinal analysis, network spinal. Um, how I discovered it. So first I want to say to your experience, that's not an uncommon thing. It's not an uncommon experience. People will often come in and, and they'll experience their first visit with me uh, based on the referral from a friend or family member saying, hey, you got to go see my chiropractor. He'll do things a little differently than what you're used to. Um, and so initially people will come in just like what you, just like you did. And they're like, what's going on? He's barely touching me. He's doing all kinds of high-tech assessments yeah. on me, but then he's barely touching me for, for the actual adjustment. It's really, really light. Um, how's that going to do anything? And then as they progress through their care, sometimes even after the very first visit, but sometimes after they progress through care, through the initial sort of higher frequency of care yeah. in the beginning, then they turn around and go, wow, my life's been transformed in a lot of really positive ways. Yeah. Um, whether it be your back that was uncomfortable because you were sitting at a, a chair for long hours yeah. um, or, or other symptoms. Also, I carry Tim on the show. Yeah. <laughs> Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so various reasons. Uh, so often people will come see us even just for wellness, for optimization in their central nervous system yeah. or for other conditions. But, um, I have to uh, caveat is that I'm not treating any of those conditions as a chiropractor. Uh, many people come in with certain medical conditions and they've tried X, Y, Z. They've tried everything under the sun. Yeah. Um, and they end up in my office and all we're doing is optimizing the way their brain and body is communicating, optimizing the function of their nervous system so that their body's innate intelligence can express itself more fully. Yeah. And when that happens, all kinds of things fall into place. So it doesn't matter what the person's medical condition is or, or, or whether they even have a medical condition or a symptom, people benefit from my care as long as they have a spine and a nervous system. And which most of us are born with. Which, exactly, right? <laughs> so people sometimes ask, well, is, it, is chiropractic for everyone? It's not for everyone. Yeah. It's only if you have a spine and a nervous system and you want to optimize that spine and nerve system function. Not everyone. It's just <laughs> right? <spine>. So some <laughs> people aren't interested in optimizing it. That's fine. But I mean, you're into technology where, you know, you have cell phones, right? You, that's, that's, I'm big that's into your it. Big yep. thing. That's your yep. thing. You always set me up with the best phones <laughs> anyway. So people who can relate to this, you have your cell phone, you have the latest cell phone, but then all of a sudden, 
uh, periodically you'll get uh, a download recommendation, Software right? Updates. Software updates. Yep. And I'm, it's usually when I'm in the middle of trying to make a call real quick or something, yep. right? Pick up my phone. Oh, software update. No, it's, it, it says, do you want to remind me later or do it now? Well, remind me later. So you can keep clicking remind me later for a certain period of time. Yep. But eventually, you're going to have to do that update. Otherwise, your phone's not going to function properly anymore with the current apps that are going on in today's world. Yep. And that's the analogy I give for the central nervous system. That's like your, op that's like your central operating system. And there's stresses, there's things happening in life. And eventually you're going to have to upgrade that system so that you can function most efficiently in today's world. That ties into reorganizational healing, yeah. which, which is one of the, it's, it's, that's not the technique that I use, but that's the paradigm, which is a huge shift from almost every other approach on the planet, whether it be medical or natural, which we can go into. I, I don't want to get ahead of no, myself, for sure. but I, I'm not, I, I've diverted from the question though. I said, no, you're, you're you, so your, your experience uh, is a common one where people yep. aren't sure to expect. And then sometimes they'll come in the second visit, the very second visit, and they'll say, wow, you barely touched me, but oh, I slept like a baby last night. I haven't slept like that in years, yep. uh, regardless of what symptoms they came in with. And that right off the hop is a sign that their central nervous system is starting to be more optimized, that there's less cortisol, adrenaline, and stress hormones surging through their body. Yep. So that's a good sign also, which is, ties into, you mentioned heart rates. It's really heart rate variability is a test that we're doing, which is a common thing in the biohacking world right now. That was the scan that you did? That's the scan. That's okay. the main scan. We do a few other scans, but the main one that I, the one that gives me the most information is, and, and patients, if they're interested in, in what's going on inside their body physiologically, is the heart rate variability test that we do before we start. So there's two things. There's a heart rate variability attached to that scan, which a lot of people know, I can explain more in details in, in, in detail in a minute, but that one is, is really important. It's ultimately become one of the gold standards for measuring adaptability in the system right. biologically. So a lot of biohackers use this. They even have devices, wearable devices nowadays, rings and watches and whatnot. And I have one on. Yeah. So, so people are, are constantly monitoring their heart rate variability. And that's one, yep. of, the, one of the really big metrics uh, if that, amongst, uh, regardless of all the other metrics that that's measuring. Yep. That, in my opinion, is one of the most important ones. And it has, um, <clears throat> it indicates all kind, all, all uh, all cause mortality, like I mentioned, yep. can be predicted just based on heart rate variability scores. Yep. So we're we're not concerned about it so much from a, a cardiac perspective because cardiologists are the ones who develop this technology. Right. We're not so concerned about it from a cardiolog from a strict cardiological perspective. We're looking at the global picture and saying, "Okay, hey, your body's adapting well or not, yep. and how is that changing over time through your course of care?" So we can monitor that along the way and monitor your baseline. We'll always do the test before an adjustment so that we can see what your baseline is. I can do a test right after an adjustment and it'll usually look pretty good. Yep. But I wanna see what kind of sustainable changes we're making in your system. In fact, US military has thousands, hundreds of thousands of pieces of data on heart rate variability because they're testing their troops coming back, going back and forth from one of the most the stress. stressful environments on the planet, yep. war, right? So they have, they have uh, really good and reliable and predictable uh, data on heart rate variability and how people adapt to stress. Yeah, this one here do. will will tell me my sleep patterns. So it gives me my sleep, uh -huh. my RAM, and all that kind of. It's called Aura Ring. Yeah. Um, I think that Samsung. I'd have to check to be sure, but I think Samsung came out with one this week that they're going to be launching. And there's another one that was. I think it's called Ringcom that just came out at CES this week um, that's also going to be doing stuff like that. So it's actually going to be a fitness one that's going to do fitness, sleep. HRV, all that kind of stuff, all built into the. So into you should be ring. getting sponsored right now for mentioning all those names. I, I, so Aura <laughs> Ring, if you're if you're out there, or any of the other guys that want to hear us, <laughs> yeah, we think Samsung. We should get Samsung. Samsung has money. A better part anyway. Well, there's a lot of money in Samsung. <laughs> and Tim, Tim likes Samsung. So from the athletic yeah. anyway, perspective, before before yeah. I go on, uh, Samsung or iPhone or iPhone or Android. I I have an iPhone. I mean, you always okay. set me up with my iPhone. So. Yeah. Well, so you knew the answer to that question. <laughs> so, so moving on, uh, just before we go on to some more specifics about your techniques, uh -huh. uh, when I started chiropractor, and I, and I go to a chiropractor now, a great chiropractor does some of the similar things that you're talking about now. Uh, but when I started going to a chiropractor, it was whenever my back went out. Mm -hmm. And he'd take me against the cork board and he'd ram me against it and crack whatever. Mm -hmm. That's the old cracking method that used to be done. When you started, how many years ago did you start? So I graduated chiropractic school in 1999. Okay. 
Start and when you started your pro practice, was it the old school so, kind of? So it, this is kind of a misnomer because old school chiropractic, when it was born, was based on a tonal model, which is that optimization of the tone in the nervous system. Right. So that's how it was born. The first chiropractic adjustment was delivered by a man named Dee Dee Palmer. His first name was Daniel, like me. Daniel David Palmer. Are all yeah. chiropractors named? Isn't your brother-in-law brother also Daniel? And yeah, there's a lot of Daniels. <laughs> okay, there's a lot of Daniels. <laughs> so never are too many Is your Daniels. name Dan? Okay. <laughs> Here's your we just get, oh, okay, well, I'm going to name my kid Dan, so yeah. he becomes a chiropractor. There you go. <laughs> Tell Cruz's name is changed to Dan. <laughs> Cruz, your name is now Dan. I'm sorry, but... Uh, <laughs> so, so yeah, so, so he delivered the first chiropractic adjustment. He was a healer. Uh, in in a in a big building, and the janitor in that building, his name was Harvey Lillard. He became deaf seventeen years prior when okay. he and he remembered the time and and play time that and, and the incident that uh, that uh, drove where he developed deafness. He was bent over and he picked something up and he felt something move in his spine. And from that moment forward, he couldn't hear. And this is this is ex in their exact words the way they the way Dee Dee Palmer describes this. He couldn't hear the ticking of a watch, which they had loud ticking watches back in yeah. those days. And he couldn't hear the racket of a wagon on the street. And, th and they had cobblestone streets, right? So uh, ra wagons, Even not loud. rubber tires. It was really really loud. Clickety clack. Yeah, clickety clack on the street. So he couldn't so much as hear those things. Um, and so Didi Palmer uh, postulated that if I was to adjust the vertebra in his spine that he felt was misaligned and take the pressure off the nerve s supply to the Those hearing, okay. uh, his hearing should be restored. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. And his hearing was restored. Uh, the second chiropractic adjustment, I believe, was uh, to a person who had heart disease. Okay. Um, and back then, they ate off the land. They didn't have all the chemicals that we have in our foods. Uh, they lived much more naturally, much more ancestrally or close to ancestral lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So they, it wasn't so much uh, atherosclerosis type of plugging of the arteries. It was a neurological, potent, yeah. potentially some kind of arrhythmia that the person might have been diagnosed with if we were to assess them today. Anyway, long story short is that was the second case that was completely resolved through oh, chiropractic yeah. adjustments. So it had nothing to do with, with back pain. Now, and, and it, it involved a structural type of adjustment where, where the chiropractor, Didi Palmer, uh, adjusted the the segment or the bone, the vertebra back into place, hmm. and so that was with what we call a structural adjustment. Right. But it was based on the tone of the nervous system. And then moving forward, he developed other techniques and strategies. and And his son B. J. Palmer developed the work even further, and then opened up schools. Um, and again, it was still all based on tone in the central nervous system. It wasn't based on well, you have symptoms or no symptoms, you have pain or no pain. Okay. We've become obsessed. So, so we've become obsessed in our in our culture today. Uh, when I say we, I not myself, but in general, society has become obsessed with being out of pain and not feeling symptoms. Yeah. Period. Whether they be physical ones, emotional ones, we've been, become obsessed with not feel, feeling symptoms. And I, that's not the way chiropractic looks. And we're talking like original chiropractic. So, so when you say old school, that's what I want to correct. Old school is what I'm doing now. Yeah, that's old school chiropractic. The actual force application, that's not as big of a. That's more just sort of depends what technique you want to use. But I could use a structural adjustment and still in, improve the tone of, of the central nervous system. I can use really light force applications with my fingertips, like I'm using now, yep. and improve the tone of the central nervous system. Um, but old school chiropractic is based on tone. So it's just different ways to skin cat. Exactly. So it is however, the same thing. Yeah, however, different ways to yeah, do it. it is. However, what you described though, we're just going to kind of crush the, you into the cork board, like you said, and just make a bunch of noise and uh, coming out of the spine. That's not chiropractic. Yeah. So chiropractic involves a specific assessment yeah. where you want to assess <laughs> and be very specific <laughs> and use the least, least amount of force applications right. along the spine. Sometimes only one, like Didi and BJ, when they developed their techniques, they had often times where they would only adjust one segment. And then there was an era where they would only adjust the top bone in the spine, Atlas, the, the, the C1 vertebra, and free up the brain stem. And yep. through that, it was kind of like if you can picture the spinal cord is attached very strongly at the top of the spine and at the lower spine, at the sacrum and coccyx. Picture it like uh, like a, a guitar string tethered at both ends. And when you pluck the guitar string at one end, boom, the reverberation goes right through all the way to the other end. So that's sort of that tonal mm -hmm. approach. So the idea there was they would adjust that top vertebra in the neck, but then other things, a person would come in with a 
a hot disc that was swollen. They were all bent sideways with a disc that was uh, injured. And yep. they would adjust the top vertebra in the neck and and then that lower back would resolve and they'd be the disc would heal no problem. So there's yes, there are many different ways to skin a cat, but ultimately the philosophy and the paradigm is the same, hasn't changed. It's been bastardized along the way yep. and turned into more of a um therapeutic approach. Um and and it in in and amongst different schools. Um, the school I went to, my alma mater, and a few other schools in the U.S. especially, they still stayed true to the uh, original principles and philosophy of D.D. and B.J. Palmer. Okay. And uh, that's why chiropractic is still alive today. Okay. Because otherwise, anything else just gets lost in the noise of what, they, of what we call or what Donnie Epstein calls um, restorative therapeutics, which is the, uh, not the opposite, but it's an alternative to reorganizational healing which we chatted a little bit about yeah. the other day. And so I don't know if you want to go into that, but that's a whole other thing. So in reorganizational healing, um, which is more along the lines of the original philosophy of chiropractic, of the tonal model in chiropractic, in reorganizational healing, we're not obsessed with not feeling symptoms, or, uh, whether they be physical ones or emotional ones. We recognize that symptoms are, uh, are they're not necessarily an obstacle. They're, they're not your adversary. They're your advisor. So looking, we're, we're shifting the, the paradigm yeah. and looking at the symptom as an advisor, as opposed to an adversary. How many times have you had some kind of debilitating symptom that came up, whether it be physical or if you known someone to have a physical or emotionally debilitating symptom where it stopped them in their tracks and it altered the course of their life. Yeah. And if the philosophy or the, the paradigm is, let me just take some kind of drug or natural therapeutics to help me not feel this symptom right now because it's uncomfortable. And let me can resume the life that I've been living. So you're not you're that's a collision it, it, course. It, it, yeah. You're essentially not treating you're not treating the problem. You're essentially masking the problem. Exactly. Right? Not only that, not only are you masking the problem, but you're robbing the person of an, a, a, a natural a, a healing. A natural the life is saying the way you're living life, the symptom is saying the way you're living life right now yep. is not working for you. Right. It, Whether it's a physical or emotional symptom, something's gotta change. So the symptoms only mean three things stop which often they become so debilitating if, we just, if you're not paying attention we just pop in drugs oh, i'm not going to feel this right now yeah. i don't like what i feel i'm not going to i'm not going to feel i'm going to take these it's over the counter it's Tylenol. no big deal well, guess what Tylenol sends over eighty thousand people to the hospital every year in the u.s alone yeah and this this was this study this uh this, uh, this data or stat statistic was from a few years ago this yeah. maybe even more now over 500 deaths every year. And this was, again, a few years ago, just in the U.S. alone, from the regular use of Tylenol. This is not like a person wants to OD and takes too much. This is regular use of acetaminophen. So, so stop. So the symptom basically means three things. Stop, yep. point number one, which sometimes it, it, it forces us to stop. I would encourage people uh, to stop even at the subtle symptoms yep. and, and then take action with number two. The second uh, strategy is to... Take inventory. So stop. Take inventory. What's yep. going on? How am I living my life? Is, is, is this really what I'm supposed to be doing and, and, and thinking and the, my behaviors, my perception, my structure? Are they all congruent right now? And, uh, and thirdly, do something different. Yep. So if the idea is let me just numb these symptoms. And again, it can be with a drug. It can be with something basic over the counter, which is still poisonous. Yep. Still sends people to the air and still kills people. Whether you want to kill your liver with acetaminophen yeah. or kill your kidneys with Advil or ibuprofen, which is w one of the biggest yeah. causes of kidney failure on the, in North America right now, um, pick your poison. Yeah. The idea is, my philosophy is, feel it now or feel it later. Yeah. So or don't it's going to be a redo. Well, that's what I mean. If you exactly, yeah, <laughs> yeah. and it's going to be don't feel anything at all. <laughs> yeah. So, so what I hear in my head, the correlation is when I'm driving in my vehicle. And I see the little light go off in my dashboard. Right. And I just try to ignore it because yeah. if I go to do something about it, it's yeah. going to cost me money. So I just ignore it and I right. ignore it. And I you ignore know it's going to cost you a lot more down the road. That in. Yeah. I, I actually, all the lights are on my dashboard. <laughs> 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 when you turn on my car, well, okay, let me premise this. My car is 14 years old. Oh, they really and, are. And it looks like a Christmas tree when you light it up. When you turn it on, I'm like, hey, look, it's like Christmas, it's like Christmas every day for me. <laughs> so you know you're on a collision course. At least you've, you've accepted it. <laughs> well, and, and for me, I guess 
when when you're 105 years old, like my car essentially is 14 years old, and in car years that would be like cool. like old, yeah. right? Like that we're yeah. at the end of its life, right? So like fixing it is just putting money into something that eventually it's just going to disappear anyway. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I guess like <laughs> morbidly, you look at it like your your 105 year old grandfather is there. Do you just let him go in peace, or do you let him go? So that's right. my car. Anyway, it's a whole different story. <laughs> so, but, but the other thing, sorry, I'm going to cut go you ahead, off for yeah. one second here. Um, there's a book. I don't know if I've, I've uh, suggested this one to you. Um, it's by a guy named Ryan Holiday, and it's called The Obstacle is the Way. Yes. And uh, it's a very good book. Um, he leans into Marcus Aurelius. I don't know if you know the philosopher. but uh, Stoic philosopher. Yeah. yeah. And he leans into that a lot. And the obstacle is a way is essentially like just because there's something painful or something happening to mm -hmm. you doesn't mean that you should turn and go somewhere else. Right. It means that like it's teaching you something. Mm -hmm. But you should also, like, you don't just sit back and let it happen. You have to actually... Stoics so will go right into it. In yeah. Fact, not only will they sit back or turn away from it, they'll, they'll go right into it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they'll welcome I, it. It's, uh, it's called The Obstacle is Away. I don't know if you've read that one, but no, it's good. Anyway, sorry, I cut you off. Uh, so I want to get into, uh, in a little bit, maybe back into the medication, uh, chiropractor versus um, American, North American med medicine. Mm -hmm. But for now, I want to talk about in your 23 years of practicing, mm -hmm. uh, you talk about how chiropractic can, can, can just make a huge difference. Can you give us an example, maybe one or two patients who came in with something and then you were able to uh, help them through what you do? Yeah. So I have countless examples. You can look through, uh, I think my assistant put a bunch of uh, testimonials on my website. So yep. people, I gather testimonials and people share with me on a pretty much daily basis some miraculous things that happen. And so I tell people now, you know what, I used to see, I used to witness miracles happening regularly in the office and I'm still blown away every time they happen, yep. but now I've come to expect them. I expect miracles for you, Greg, when you come see me in the office. I expect miracles for you, Tim, when you come see me in the office in the future. The, the thing I love about when I'm getting adjusted is you're telling me what's happening. Mm -hmm. And th this is one thing, I, like I said, I haven't gone to any other chiropractors. I, I can't speak to what other chiropractors do. But you're telling me what's happening and you're telling me what's going to happen and what's changing and I think that by speaking that, me and Tim, actually, we just talked about this in, a, in an episode, two episodes ago, I think. Last episode. If you, if you look back, um, about like speaking what you're going to do, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and changing your mindset and changing that, that kind of stuff. It's when very you're, intentional. Yeah, and it's an intentional thing. I feel like when you're doing your chiropractic work, it's an intentional thing and you're also telling people what you're doing is that is that something that works into that so sort of but not completely so i have very intentional outcomes that i'm looking for mm -hmm. while i'm working on people yeah and i think everyone needs to have that no matter what work they're doing whether they're working with people or working with a car you're fixing your vehicle then there needs to be a specific outcome you're looking for mm -hmm. otherwise you're just randomly shot in the dark right so i have very specific my teachers i have great awesome mentors and teachers and that's one of the things that they've uh, hammered home for me is that have be clear on your outcomes. So I'm clear on my outcomes, but at the same time, I'm not so clear that, well, you came in with uh, condition X and I'm going to make condition X go away. No, 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 no. That's the practice of medicine because yep. condition X might be the solution to what's going on. The, the, the old saying, the cure is in the disease. Well, your body may have adapted properly to something and it's showing up as a symptom. Yep. My taking away that symptom from you or having that as my outcome could be a violation to you mm -hmm. and to what's really going on. So my outcome, I have specific outcomes based on the parameters I'm looking at, but my sort of bigger outcome is one of my mentors often has said, uh, I'm here as a chiropractor to allow your innate intelligence to express itself more fully. Mm -hmm. And whatever happens after that is none of my business. Yeah. In other words, let your God give it. So God gives you your innate intelligence. And that's the intelligence. Innate means it's inborn. You're born with it. Yeah. And it's the intelligence that stirs your cells into life. It's, it's the difference between you and a dead corpse. You have innate intelligence that's stirring your cells into life, constantly repairing and, and reorganizing and healing tissues. Yeah. And keeping you alive. 
Yeah. So my my intention is to uh, allow for greater expression of that innate intelligence. And then what happens after that's none of my business. In other words, who am I to say that this is supposed to go away or that's supposed to be different or that your fever should come down? Maybe your fever should come up when you come see me. Kids, because it's battling parents, something. Exactly. Parents can bring their kids in. This goes back to your question here, Tim. Parents bring their kids in to see me all the time. Babies and infants and colicky, whatever. I'm not trying to treat the colic. I'm trying to express, allow innate intelligence to express itself more. So maybe a fever and even good pediatricians in the medical realm will acknowledge this as well. When the child has a fever, it needs to come. That's the innate immune system that's, that's working. And what do, what's the common, common paradigm is, well, let's give them a drug, a set of medicine or something, children's Tylenol, to, to bring, the fever, bring the fever down. Oh, that's completely contradictory to what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to wake things up in the system. And often I'll tell parents, the baby's fever might come up a little bit. That's okay. As long as, as, long as their behavior is, is still normal, they're still drinking, they're hydrated. Monitoring it. Like, you it, obviously have, have to be a, careful. Yeah, but they can right? have a really high fever, especially infants. They can have a much higher fever than adults without it being dangerous. So... And, and exactly, monitoring their hydration and their electrolytes, all that stuff, if they're eating and drinking, that's yep. great. Now, back to your question, though. Do you have something else you want to add? Yeah, just keep, I'll come back to you. So back to your question. question. So that's a big one we see all the time in infants. Parents bring in their kids in. I've got a, 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 a young lady I'm working on still to this day. She is probably in her 20s now. And her mom brought her in when she was six months old, had been on round of antibiotic after antibiotic after antibiotic from the day she was born pretty much until six months with ear infections, yep. constant and chronic ear infections for the first six months of her life and co constant and chronic uh, prescriptions for antibiotics. She brings her in to see me within the first couple of visits, no more antibiotics and that's it. Ear infections are irrelevant now. Yeah. And she's still seeing me to this day on a wellness basis. So that's a big one we see all the time. That's just not one isolated incident. That's a, a good example of, of things that happen all the time in my office. An interesting one that, that uh, since you asked me that question about some interesting uh, um, cases, I had a lady who came in to see me. I don't know what her initial concern was. People often come in with a concern, whether it's a symptom or something, or they just want to en enhance well-being, what we call the salutogenic effect, which we can talk about in a second also, if you want to remind me about that, because that's, a again, paradigm. I don't know the word. I can't pronounce okay. it. Okay. <laughs> salute. Salute. Think salute. Okay. So just remind me. Just, Your daughter's just, going to military? Salute, think salute. I think okay. salute. Uh, <laughs> it's like five the salute word. Never <laughs> talk about that. <laughs> so so, so, so it, 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 it basically the opposite of pathogenic. So oh, okay. genic means genesis, right? Like okay. in the Bible, it's the beginning. So how does something start? Well, pathogenic, something that starts a disease. What started the disease? Pathogenic. It's a pathogenic bacteria. It's a bacteria that can, you know, cause bad things in your system. Um, so it's the opposite of, of pathogenic, salutogenic. Okay. But medicine doesn't really have anything that's salutogenic. Really, when you really break it down, their idea of wellness is yeah. early detection. Let's get you in for a bunch of tests and detect cancer early or detect things early. That's not wellness. So then what? So you've detected it. So why not live your lifestyle now? So you're going to change your lifestyle once you detect something early? Why not change your lifestyle now yeah. and optimize your system now and do all of that stuff now? So those tests become irrelevant. Mm -hmm. So, but back to the to your question. Sorry, just yeah, one no, cool example because yeah. it's a pretty cool example uh, uh, of, of a, a case study. Um, she comes in. I don't know what her concern was. I don't remember because it was quite a while ago. And I worked on her a few visits and then she left town or something. She moved to Quebec or something and then or just hadn't seen her in like 10 years. Yep. And then she comes back, she finds me at my new office and 10 years later and she says, you know, um, when I saw you way back 10 years ago, I didn't see you for that long, but it was miraculous. She said, I, I had like, oh yeah, I had like a lower back thing or something, back symptoms, lower back pain. That, that was fine. That went away. No problem after a few visits. But what I found was after the very first visit, not after two or three visits, very first visit, she said, I've been a chain smoker for years. Chain smoker, pack a day. And she said, I left the office. I lit up a smoke and it tasted like Can I say that on this podcast? You can. We'll, well we can just more. repeat okay. later on. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm just quoting her. Week. I'm quoting her. Your quote, yeah. And so she said. We'll, we'll put it up on the quotes. <laughs> <laughs> so she said, I, I put, I, I, I butt the cigarette out, yep. drove home. When I got home, I lit up another one thinking, okay, oh man, this is going to work now. It always and amazes me that people think that it tastes good in the first place. But anyway. Right, right. That's, that is amazing. <laughs> yeah. So then she lights another one and she says, it tastes even worse. 
She never lit another cigarette ever again for the rest of her life for that for those past ten years. Yeah, we we talked. Actually, gonna... There was a story that we talked about a couple of weeks ago where someone said the words over and over, "This cigarette," even though they love cigarettes, they uh-huh. said over and over, uh, "This cigarette's horrible. I hate smoking." Uh-huh. And they didn't do anything else. They kept smoking, and all of a sudden, one day, they woke up and the cigarette tasted tastes like shit. So that's yeah. the power of auto suggestion. However, here, so we're there, not talking any suggestion yeah. here, yeah. and that you brought the, uh, that up a little bit. My intention, if I'm speaking it, it makes it more powerful. Perhaps, yeah, for yeah. sure, it does. Like that's in any yeah. route, it'll make it more does. powerful. Absolutely. But in this case, I didn't say anything about her smoking. She didn't even intend on quitting smoking. She had tried historically to no avail. And she was like, forget it. I'm giving up. I'm never going to try this again. I'm I'm just going to keep. And then she lights up and just spontaneously. And that's the kind of spontaneous healing and wellness that people experience. So the other thing is when we work on infants, um, there's no power of suggestion there either. Right. So, because sometimes people say, yeah. "Oh, you're barely touching." It must be just like auto suggestion that people feel better, placebo effect. Uh, uh-uh. uh, yeah. no. infants, animals, case study with the smoking lady. Yeah, it's just incredible. Like I'm blown away. I, I get so excited even just talking about it, and I see it every day. Yeah, in in the office. So for me, I, you know, you ask me, "Why did you guys choose chiropractic?" All of you, it's it's a passion. Like yeah. it's a lifestyle. It's more than a lifestyle. It's a passion. And it's a vehicle through which we can share that passion with others. Yeah. So um, just so, so that everybody that's watching or listening knows that linked below is all of Dr. Dan's information. So his website, his contact information, all that kind of stuff. So if you live in the Winnipeg area, you can always contact him. Or if you are in another area, I believe that you have a pretty good network of people in different areas. I think I, I asked you for somewhere for my aunt in Toronto and that type of thing. Like, yeah, you have if you're like that this. far away, yeah, there are people in the Toronto, Ontario area, people in the uh, Alberta area, yeah. um, BC as well. I'm not trying to However, do a commercial for you or anything like that, no, but like for people that are sure, right I want now, people to have it's this. It's got to be in the contact. I, absolutely. I, I, want people, I want people to have this work uh, yeah. around the planet. There are people, there are practitioners around the planet who are, who are practicing this work and yeah i can refer people to the right person uh i also have people in manitoba who'll drive in a lady yesterday she drives in from the uh russell manitoba area and, and about five six hours yeah uh and she'll drive in once every couple of weeks for her adjustment her and her family get adjusted that's fantastic um and she'll pass by a whole bunch of other chiropractors just to come see me a lot of people drive in from carmen a couple hours away uh, a lot of people from steinbeck area so uh people will drive a long distance to come and access the care um, because it's that transformational, but yeah, if it's Toronto or other areas that are really far away, then yeah, I've got other network and, of practitioners. And we do have, we have listeners like all over the world as, as Tim likes to ask me, he's like, well, where's our listeners from today? Like yeah. we've got people cool. in, like yeah. Russia, and international. Thailand, yeah. international podcast here with awesome. me and Tim. But, uh, generally, um, we, we want to get the information out to people. So like that, that's a great way. And you know, if, cool. if they're in this area, I would. I would definitely suggest them to come see you. Yeah. So I hope that you have a couple openings still left for me and Lorraine and stuff like that after for of that. Course. But anyway, so, anyway, I'm going to get you. So I can see in your face, I can see in how you speak that you're very passionate about this and that that's fantastic. It's awesome. I can, we can just see if you're out there. If you can't notice this, it's just like, he's clear. It's very passionate. Can we zoom in further? About. <laughs> not too far not close too far not too close <laughs> so like and, and and going back to we're talking about dealing with the symptom uh-huh. rather than being proactive about things and living that healthy lifestyle uh-huh. and you see that every cold and flu season we were in a hospital we don't go often but we were there a couple months ago and the amount of backup because people are going there for a cold and right. a flu cold. is ridiculous yeah. right they're just treating the symptom right um, potentially cost- prolonging it and making it worse. Yeah. Like sure. you take something to suppress a cough. Yeah. People know now, even the medical realm will say, don't suppress a cough. Yeah. Even the med- the, by the medical cough is on purpose. Well, absolutely. The fever, the cough, those are all that are supposed to be there. They're right. part of your immune system. Yeah. You suppress the cough, you end up with it going deeper into the, into the lungs, potentially even causing pneumonia down the road. So you don't want to suppress those innate mechanisms. Yeah. It's, and it's crazy now, uh, in the day and age we live, it seems like, and it's not just chiropractor. There's so many other natural ways in which we improve our health, whether right. it's exercise, whether it's diet, whether it's going to uh, this specialist or whether it's chiropractor, mm-hmm. that it seems like people are moving away from one doctor, one GP, where they go to everywhere, where they're mm-hmm. taking more control of their own personal health journey. Mm-hmm. Do you see that as a, a kind of a trend that people are looking to uh, going towards that base? 
I think it's a trend that's been going on for a long time because statistically, while I was back in chiropractic school, we would look at all these statistics because I was immersed in it. We were, uh, I went to the biggest chiropractic school in the world. So we had all these statistics and whatnot. I was taking seminars every weekend because uh, it was right there. That was the Mecca for yeah. chiropractic and wellness. It was, and back then the statistics were that the, the, uh, there were more people seeking out more than 50% of the population were seeking out, uh, alternative, what they would call alternative healthcare practitioners yeah. than actual regular, uh, medical doctors. Okay. And of that chiropractic was the biggest, uh, was the dominant field that people were seeking out of that 50, 52% or something of the people were seeking out alternative versus medicine. So which one is alternative is what I, is what people would ask. Which yeah. is really alternative. I guess it's not mainstream. So you call it alternative. You call it alternative, but, but which one's mainstream? If 52% of the population is seeking that out versus this out, then which one's mainstream, which alternative? It's all semantics. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't bother me. You can call me alternative. Call me all kinds yeah. of things. People have all kinds of weird ideas, like you were saying, when they come in to see me. And, and there's some people are even well, scared and nervous. They're not sure what to expect. They've heard all kinds of stories, horror stories. And then after being under care for a period of time, it's like, wow, it's just, it blows all those myths out of the water. Yeah. And a little bit later on, we're going to get into more, um, different dietary stuff and stuff like that. Sure. That me and you have talked about yeah. in the past because I thought that was super exciting, but we're going to leave that for the second half here. Um, the question I guess that some people are asking though, is how do you empower your patients to view the symptoms or crisis? As opportunities for growth how do you let your patients know that this is an opportunity for growth and how do you work with your patients yeah. on that? so you're the last is it three years since the the so-called started can i talk the, like the that thing, the the thing, yeah the thing. Or, or is that gonna get you canceled <laughs> it made, it made how about, we about the mma fight the other night yeah. oh uh I, by the way i'm all into going into that <laughs> avenue i'm just kidding we can we can all tangents that'll get you canceled <laughs> we we generally call it the thing we don't he talk doesn't about like to use certain words <laughs> no okay we, we okay. Okay. okay greg didn't say it i said, <laughs> we said it we, we said it on It'll our, get bleeped our first it. interview our first interview that we did uh, earlier this week that's going to come out uh, at the end of February, uh, we've said a few of those words again, but I, I, I digress on that. It, we call it the thing we don't talk about. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that alone, just, it says, speaks volumes. Yeah. When you can't, that's 1984 right there. You yeah. can't talk about this. we got to give it a code name. Yeah. Holy smoke. And, and by the way, just for the record, I'm all for talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> Greg's the diplomatic one He's here. The diplomatic it's, it's not really <laughs> diplo diplomacy. It's more so like, I know what YouTube is. Yeah, you know what'll get you canceled. Yeah, they're going to just <laughs> not show this to everybody. But it's funny that we can laugh about the fact that this and this and this will get you canceled. Yeah. Um, and that in and of itself, for me, are things I want to do a deeper dive into. Not not here on this show, but yeah. in general, when I read something, it's like, yeah. why are they using a code word for this? Or they have to bleep it out. Yeah. That means there's more to this. If the the system is trying to get us to not know about this, then I want to research it more and know about it. Well, yeah. it's, it's funny because even um, not even talking about COVID, which we are a little bit hesitant to talk about on the show for mm -hmm. whatever reason, but even all these quote unquote alternative medicines um, uh, in, in Canada now, uh, we're seeing this kind of clamp down to what you're allowed to give. Oh, people, sure. What you're allowed to use. Yeah. Even more so than the United States. Yeah. The federal government has made it very difficult for a small startup company. Like I was telling Greg about this bison supplement company, which is bison organ supplements and capsules. And they, I was able to get my first few orders straight through them through Alberta. Great, you know, local Canadian company. Yeah. And the federal government has, has tightened down their restrictions to the point where now you can get heroin and cocaine and these illicit drugs in British Columbia, fentanyl. Or you can get like a couple grams of this stuff and carry it with yeah. you, but you can't buy an or a bison organ supplement straight yeah. from Canada. They have to go through the U.S. distributor and back to, back to Canada. But nonetheless, I, you know, we can still get it. Done. We still get it. Yeah, and that's what we're just, just making said. it more challenging yeah. for the business. What you just yeah. said is crazy. Like if people were to stop and think about what you said about what it's easier to get. Yeah, you can't get raw milk. Yeah. But you can you can yeah. get a couple of grams and, of and that other illicit stuff. The, and I can't underscore yeah. exactly that point. That's just crazy to me. Yeah. Isn't it nuts? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. those are all things that it's like, whoa, red flag, man. Like, do your research. Yeah. What's and so now the and the next thing they're telling you, these globalists is you're gonna be eating crickets, but you shouldn't eat red meat because it's gonna kill the planet. Yeah. Which is more BS. Yeah. But we can go into that once we go into the nutritional strategies. For so, sure. So triad of change. 
Okay, wait, wait, wait there was something else that we were talking about. In uh, a second. I asked you how you empower your patients. Oh, how I empower them. So, so we'll go back. What I was, the point I was trying to make, I wasn't trying to go into a no, tangent no. about... No, no, uh, no, just hand, Tim goes into tangent. And, be, and before you start your answer, do you, when you have a patient... <laughs> a new come, tangent. <laughs> when you come, have a patient come into you, do you feel that they are more open to it anywhere? Or do you need to make the change so they do think differently? Both. Okay. Both. Um, a lot of times, most of my practice is referral based. So a lot of times people come in and they've been told by their friend, their loved one, their neighbor, their spouse, their kids that um, will be doing things differently. And they're starving for this yeah. yep. paradigm shift now. They're done with treating symptoms and trying to trying to cover things up, even with natural remedies, because a lot of natural remedies out there yep. are the same medical paradigm. If the objective is, if the outcome you're looking for is to give me my old life back and let me go back onto that same old collision course minus the symptom, then take morphine, take a drug, whatever, take a natural remedy. It's the same thing. Do yoga. If your objective is to get rid of the symptoms so you can keep back on that same collision course life, same relationships, same food, same activities same behaviors same philosophy same paradigm it's a collision course yep. it's going to be a redo something's going to happen it's going to usually be a more wake up call that's a lot louder and if, if you yeah if you want to do get the same result yeah. do the exact same, same thing exactly the definition, the definition of sanity. Sanity. Definition yeah exactly sanity. so back to your question though, i'm going yep. off the tangent so back it's to okay. your question my point was none of this would have happened in the last four years okay all the stuff that's happened yeah the stuff the fear-based fear-mongering stuff that people have been persuaded or coerced into doing in the last three to four years mm -hmm. since 2020 is springtime 2020 yep. from lockdowns to all the other measures none of them none of and we know now we we know for a fact that none of it worked and none of it none of those measures would have even taken place because they wouldn't have been able to scare people into those measures if people had confidence in their body's innate intelligence, mm -hmm. your innate intelligence knows more in one second than every doctor, including me, in the world knows in a lifetime. And if I can empower people with just leaving my office knowing that, like really knowing it, embodying it, oh, life will be magical and effortless. Yeah. Well, I, I think I had said something online about the whole thing and I said, well, nobody's talking about uh, physical exercise and diet. Vitamin D and all nobody stuff. The federal you, government's yeah. not my teaching that. But no. the, somebody commented, well, let's get through this and then we'll talk about it. My favorite is the um, overweight guy eating McDonald's, taking his mask on and off. <laughs> Well, that not only that, but the the uh, and then having a smoke outside. <laughs> they incentivize that sometimes actually. They, incent <laughs> they incentivize some of the measures by rewarding people with hamburgers yeah. and fries and dunk. Uh, I remember Krispy seeing Kreme that donuts. governor in New York. There's a governor, yeah. He's like, was that Cuomo? I don't know. No. What's Cuomo, he, he has it's one of the bears. Bigger. Yeah, it was Cuomo. He had some other issues. He had a hamburger. He had fries. He's like, like and you get fries? You get fries? What are you talking about? Yeah, and then he got them. And there's another another state where they were giving away Krispy Kreme donuts. Yeah. Um. So, so I was, yeah, I was just wanting to get the free donuts. Okay, so yeah, let's yeah. uh, need a Krispy Kreme in, here. Oh, we are. Up, I guess. Great. So, well, more incentives for more people incentives. to do for other things. He, he, he loves <laughs> Take your medicine. You get Krispy Kreme. Kreme. <laughs> it's the devil. Well, for me, it's the devil. You know what? Everything is good in moderation. Crack uh, okay, cocaine. So, no, no. So, <laughs> so I don't. So let, let me get this straight because Tim, Tim will go on tangents <laughs> for a half an hour about these kinds of things. So Tim will go on a tangent about half an hour about these things. I don't drink. I've never smoked in my life. <clears throat> never had any kind of drugs. All that kind of stuff. But yeah, I do like a donut every now and again. And I do like cake. And I do, like, obviously I'm not, like, in the best shape of my life. And I want to be in the best shape of my life. But at the it's same time... It's not a time, staple food on a daily basis for you. Yeah, but at the same time, like, I don't want to live in a restrictive lifestyle that really like just you know what i mean like yeah. i don't want to live in a lifestyle that for, for some that that's is... so unsustainable that it would make them fall off the wagon every day yeah tim ferris talks about this where you got like the one cheat day in the four hour body you got the one cheat day per week where you have to cheat like it's not even optional and it, it, it's like a psychological thing and you it, do that right and I, it stimulates I used to cut my cheat day out, but it used to be it was sunday jesus day was always cheat day okay yeah. so and, and it psychologically sets the stage so that well no i'm not gonna cheat 
five, six days in a row because yeah. I know I get to cheat on that seventh day and I'm going to cheat until I feel sick to my stomach type of cheating. That's kind of, that's worse which, though. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm, I'm not a fan of that either. And for to varying degrees, depending on your character, like Paul Saladino, he's the opposite. He's the carnivore MD. He says, you know, I won't cheat at all because it's all or nothing for him. So for some people, it's all or nothing. Yeah. And for others... They do really well psychologically and physiologically with uh, one day of cheat. And you can choose your cheat meals as well. It doesn't have to be the worst foods on the planet full of polyunsaturated fats. and, and the, the Yeah, what are you craving? Thing. That's what I find. Right. Like you can crave grapes or you can crave a donut. Yeah. Depends on what the psychological yeah. and makeup and is. And I think that uh, people that do the whole cheat day thing, if they overindulge, mm -hmm. it's kind of like drinking, right? People that don't drink, that overindulge, feel like crap the next day, so, right? And, it, and then that's your body telling you that that was the wrong thing to do. Maybe eventually your body can actually, as, like you'll learn from that. As long as you're compassionate enough with yourself, there's studies out of, I think, Stanford University on compassion. And um, I can't remember the name of the studies. I think it's like the throw in the towel studies. But long story short is they took a bunch of, of uh, university-aged women who were very conscious about their body and their physical appearance, okay, and their weight. Yep. And uh, they said, we're doing an experiment here and basically we have to test these candies and you have to eat a lot of these candies. But before you eat these, so you can test them and you know rate them for the manufacturer. But before we do this, you're gonna have to pound back uh, a full donut and a big glass of water. And then you're gonna go do the candy drill uh, uh, experiment. And they're like, oh geez, that's, oh, that's gonna be tough. Cause these, they're, they're never, these type of people that would never do that kind of stuff. Yep. So, but half of the group, they tell them, don't be too hard on yourself. Right. That's it. Nothing else. They don't coach them in any other way other than don't be too hard on yourself. It's just a one-time thing. These things happen. People do this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The other group, they tell them nothing. So the group that they told, don't be too hard on yourself. They, they, they eat as much candy as you can basically is the thing. Yep. They only ate about half as much candy as the other group. The other group had this throw in the towel. I'm a useless piece of way so i might as well just keep on eating yeah. same thing that's what happens with drunk uh, people who have are alcoholics you'd think they'd have the next morning the the physical hangover feeling like crap and the moral hangover oh, i fell off the wagon again why did i have died what have i done i'm wasting my life away i'll never do this again you'd think that would be the thing but it's the opposite they throw in the towel well it's like i might as well i i messed yeah. up my weekend exactly i'm a loser anyway so i'm going to go ahead and drink again the next night yeah. and the next night and the next night so it's important for a person like you, you have compassion for yourself. So you could probably look at that and feel, ah, oh, what have I done last night? I'm never, do, I'm not doing this again yeah. for a long time. Right. You can, some people will respond when you yell at them and say, right. more you dirty piece of junk, yeah, hit yeah. your ass on the field and <laughs> yeah. do that. Okay, okay. And the next person's like, I give But up. what the cool. studies are showing is for the most part, don't be too hard on yourself when you screw up. Right. Because you're more likely to screw up again. You're just throwing the towel. Well, yeah, everyone messes passion. up. We're human, right? Right. Especially Greg who goes to Krispy Kreme. He'll be there every <laughs> second day. So you pound back a dozen Krispy Kremes. Don't be too hard on yourself. Yeah, don't be too hard on yourself. <laughs> so I don't pound back a dozen Krispy Kremes. Anyway. I will have a big Krispy Kreme. In the States when I was in school, yeah, yeah back in Atlanta. You pounded back a dozen. They'd have the light that would turn on. <laughs> so when you go to Krispy Kreme, I back, yeah. um, so I've only been to a couple, but the one in Las Vegas, I don't know if they all do this, but they, they make them in front of you, right? Yeah, yeah. And then you get a free one Even if it's your first time there. Right. And I'll always just tell them I'm first time there. It's <laughs> so dishonesty. Oh yeah, yeah. For eating, <laughs> it's my first time at that Krispy Kreme. <laughs> I call but them anyway. two truths and one lie, Greg, because there's always two truths about one lie. <laughs> but anyway, it's yeah, like Krispy Kremes are good. If if Krispy Kremes watching and they want to sponsor more sponsors, <laughs> the Aura Ring, Samsung, I'll take Krispy it. Kremes, Samsung. I want to. I want a ring now, but uh, <laughs> well. I'll, how much? I'm not the, telling you again. How much for your spy, spy glasses? I'm not way. telling you about any of the purchase. <laughs> anyway, I think uh, the devices are great. The wearables are great, and I wear mine on and off. I have more of a, like a one that fits on my chest, and I'm just concerned about wearing it all the time. Is that Topless Tuesdays that you do that? 
<laughs> Sorry, there's no, there's no such thing as top and one Tuesdays. <laughs> They're not supposed to know about that. <laughs> Don't tell his wife there's topless Tuesdays. It's only the chiropractor that's topless. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so no, I was more concerned. I was going to talk about EMFs, but that's that's it. Like I'm not sure what kind of EMFs from Bluetooth and whatnot that yeah. is usually connecting with the, with some kind of a yeah. Bluetooth you don't device. carry your phone in your front pocket, right? No, I, my phone's right here. Uh, I try to avoid it in any of my pockets. Where do you put your phone? I, I carry it in my hand. I just throw it on you the throw seat or throw it on the console. Tim has a driving. fanny pack. And it, he carries his own Frankie's fanny pack. the the name. The name of his fanny pack is you Frankie. Call it, you and named I, it your fanny pack? Named it Frankie, but since it's gotten cold and I have pockets, I have neglected Frankie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you're better off with Frankie. You'll put it in his jacket. Distance yeah. is your best friend when it comes yeah. to those types of things. Um, when it comes to any kind of radiation, yeah. whether it's ionizing radiation and x-ray, we know that distance is exponential yeah. when it comes to the amount of radiation. And very similar for EMFs. Distance is really, you can get all kinds of weird shielding strategies and, and devices. Yeah. I don't know if I trust all of them or, or neutralizing devices. I, I don't know. How Sometimes well it's hard to... Um, stop something uh -huh. like avoid something that you like i i guess the, the question is like if you work hard to avoid it because you think it's going to do something to you is that hurting you more stressful like, yeah is that making you more for me stressed? it's not stressful because I'm, I'm at when i'm at the office all day working on people i never have my phone on yeah, me i wouldn't even want to have it on me so um yeah it's 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 put aside and uh, other than that, I'm either going somewhere or, uh, yeah, it's just, it's either in my hand because I'm messaging someone, yeah. which is away from vital organs, the brain and the genitals, because uh, we know now that it has an impact on sperm count, uh, which ultimately has an impact on testosterone and hormones in general. So, yeah. and, you know, I was telling a friend of mine, he, he's done having, he's like, oh, I don't care. I'm done having kids. Well, I was going to just point, say that, but. but that's not the point. <laughs> the point is, do you want to have healthy hormones or not? Yeah. Till, till you're an old age. Yeah. Um, so the idea is that, yeah, you don't want, it's a hormone disruptor. EMF is a hormone disruptor. And Olympic athletes, so, uh, or coaches for Olympic athletes are big on that. Never. All, all these kids the now have phones on them when they're like 10, yep. 11, 12 years old. We were just talking about this in the last episode about like kids having phones earlier in their lives. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're thinking because it's more of a, a safety net for parents, right? Yeah, like sure. you get a hold of their kids anytime. Yeah, you communicate with them. But the whole hormone disruptor, yeah. now these kids having them, like yeah. we grew up mm -hmm. and we didn't have a cell phone. I didn't have a cell phone until I was 18 mm -hmm. and it was more so to drive back and forth to the city. Mm -hmm. um, but now kids have them early. Do you think that eventually that's going to become something that's going to affect them when I, they're 25, 30, 40 years old? I mean, I we think don't it, know yet, it, right? I, we don't necessarily know, but I, I would suspect yes. I would assume yes and just just act as if... That's as if it will be an issue. So what do you do? You don't want to be just like anything else. Like I said, you know, you want to taste, test things early, early detection, and then do something about it. No, you're going to, you're going to want to live that lifestyle now yeah. as opposed to changing your lifestyle once they find something. So, uh, my kids never, never have a, a conversation like this yeah. with their friends. It's usually laying on something and they're FaceTiming, speaker their phone, friends, speaker phone, FaceTiming, whatever with Bluetooth? friends. Uh, Bluetooth, we had got them. They were insisting on getting Bluetooth two Christmases ago. Yeah. Uh, uh, earbuds yeah and so i don't know what we were thinking we we bought them the earbuds and they were in their stocking and then like within a week or two i was like what are we doing this is ridiculous we can't have that emf right there not only is it right next to their brain it's like in there in the ear canal um so so no i'm not taking that chance okay is it for sure i don't know i've well, seen studies that show tell, but right? yeah and i'm not gonna wait for that time to come before yeah. i say this is not good so yeah. um I, I, especially in the developing brain and in the developing system, uh, you know that's why we would you know do X-rays on a on a on a uh, a toddler or a, a young teen yeah. unless we had to. Yeah, you got to you know the benefits must outweigh the cost, and in this case, it's optional whether they have the thing right in their ear or have the wired headset. So they're back to the old school wired. I 
I convinced them that, you know, it was kind of cool to go old school <laughs> and uh, we're starting to trend. <laughs> and it's funny wire. because you were just talking about the physiological aspects of the, what you're talking about with the phones and everything connected yeah. to us. And that's not even going into the social, the psychological, emotional absolutely. Uh, yeah, absolutely. issues that are we're creating. Yeah, media and, and communication and skills. And yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah. My, my, my child Dependent doesn't know how to. Dopamine. Uh, my child just got a new job and they're like, I don't know how to use the phone. <laughs> my part of my job yeah. is to call on the phone a potential client. Uh-huh. And it's like, like with a I'm, real phone. Yeah, with, with a real, real ground phone. Like, I don't know how to do that. Right. Right. And yeah. this is crazy. Like, well, you just talk on the phone. Just talk yeah. on the phone. Yeah. But it's so foreign to them because yeah. they're texting. Uh, they're just doing other ways of communication, and they're not actually able to have a conversation in that way. Right? Mm-hmm. Even though they're very outgoing, they can. They, if they're if you're standing right in front of you, they can talk to you. But right. making a simple phone call. That- but yeah, there's the whole thing, and, and the big thing is dopamine release. So if a person historically had to exercise hard or do hard things to get a certain reward in the brain, biochemically, neurochemically, the dopamine yeah. reward. Yeah. They had to they had to achieve something or win at something or do something hard like a hard exercise round. Um, that was what required for a reward. So it was very motivating. Now you can get that same reward from scrolling through and seeing just what the next thing is. It doesn't even have to be anything that interesting. Yep. It can just be Instagram scrolling yep. and seeing, oh, what's the next thing? It's that sense of like. surprise. Oh, I got a like. There's yeah, something wrong with Facebook. I yeah. don't have too many likes, right? Yeah. So, uh, so it's the dopamine thing, and then the brain requires yeah. it down regulates, you know, its own production. So you need more and more stimulus in order to get that reward. You don't get that reward from a meaningful conversation with someone anymore, or from uh, you know playing a sport because now you can get it from this. Yeah. So part one, I thought was very cool because we got to find out why he got into chiropractic care and why he does it in a different way which he says is actually the old school way when you said old school was cracking backs right so i thought that that was very interesting that he had a different outlook on chiropractic care and uh i i know firsthand that i've i've uh, benefited from his care yeah it was one of those questions where even though i was incorrect in my assumption when i made it it led to good conversation because it was a common myth that people had so um yeah it was very interesting i really enjoyed it Yeah, it was fun. He um, brings a different perspective, and I feel like his passion is there for for his chiropractic business. So, practice. Practice makes perfect. Perfect practice. Anyway, so that was part one. Uh, Stay tuned. Next week, we will have part two of the episode, where you'll check out a little bit more about Dr. Dan, about why he does certain health, like eating tips some exercise tips and uh we dive into something that tim really didn't like we had a surprise there's a surprise twist ending at the end like any good movie has a twist ending you gotta twist that ending part two has a twist and a shout i think there's a shout in there too (laughs) isley brothers twist and shout thanks for watching we'll see you again next week thanks for watching the greg and tim show podcast don't forget to like Subscribe and share with all your friends. Sharing is caring.